All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we're going to pick up where we left off in Chapter Four. We were we were talking about uh, this uh, padding property uh, and how it helps to improve the visual layout of, and spacing, really, of objects in in uh, browser. And like many of the properties that we're going to be working with, especially when you start working with this, what we call a, a box or a shape that sits around all the objects that we work with. It is also possible, just like we did with the border, to actually specify individual sides of an object for padding. So I don't have to do what I just did in the previous slides, where I put the padding on there, and it goes the same amount of padding all the way around all the edges of the object. Sometimes that's exactly what you want to do, and sometimes it's not. So sometimes you'll find that you only want to put the padding on the left, or the right, or the top, or the bottom. But just remember with the padding, it always sits in between the border and the content of whatever you're putting in. So it is very possible if you want to uh, individually apply padding in various degrees to various sides, you can totally do that. And you know what? Sometimes that's what's needed. Sometimes it just looks better if you're putting you know, more padding on the top or more on the bottom or more on the left. And, you know, one really good example of that in what we were just working on is in my HTML here, remember I like forced in a bunch of spaces at the beginning because otherwise home was right at the edge and I thought it looked horrible. Well, you know what? I don't have to do it by putting in spaces. I can actually get rid of that and actually do that with, with padding. And so... I'm going to, you know, I should, what I should probably do actually first is I should save this. Now keep in mind that whatever changes I make to this page, I really should make to all the others as well. But we'll, we'll just focus on one page for right now. Um, and I'm going to go back to the browser now and refresh. Now you see how it all shifted over again. Now you might look at that and say, you know what, that's actually okay. It's not really too bad. But then you might look at it and say, you know what, it does need to move over a little bit. So let's experiment with applying the padding selectively. And I'm going to show you several different techniques for it. Okay. So padding, like border, I can selectively apply padding to top and bottom by just saying top. right? And then what I could do is I could take this whole line. I want the, the, the padding on the top and the bottom to be the same, at least for right now. So I'm going to... Go like that. But I want the left padding to be a little bit different. So I'm going to say padding dash left. You know, I might go like 30 pixels. Much more, much more. So let's save that and take a look, do a refresh. And I'm kind of back to where I was when I had the spaces in there. That's a matter of experimentation. What the right amount is, is really once again, very subjective. But the general rule of thumb is, if you have the space, use it. Make it comfortable for the eye to find things. But you can selectively apply it. Now, you can do that selective application by individually declaring top, bottom, left, etc. But there's a shortcut technique. And that's what the slideshow goes to um, next. So. All right, so we were here, right? Where, all right, all right, we were here, right? Selectively applying to individual sides. Then they show you that there's a, a shortcut technique, and there's actually two shortcut techniques, and really three shortcut techniques, but I always forget the third one, frankly. All right, so what they're going to show you here next is that here, instead of saying top and bottom, left and right, they actually start just saying padding again, and instead of providing one value for padding, they're providing two. The first value, it says, configures top and bottom, and the second one considers uh, configures left and right. So as you often do with like, stuff like this when it's in a box, you might find that the top and bottom should be the same, and the left and right should be the same, but they might be different. So here, you can use this approach by providing two values. Remember, first one does top and bottom, second one does left and right. And that might be a perfect technique for you guys. All right. 
Other times you'll see this approach. <coughs> and notice that this one provides four values. And the four values are, as indicated here, top, right, bottom, and left. Okay, so what I always like to say with that is when I see that, and I'm bringing up Notepad++, plus, plus, you know, it's like top, what was it? Top, right, right, and then you got to remember that, right? Bottom and left. But if you look at those and just look at the first letters of those, it's T R B L trouble. Just remember trouble and you got it. Okay? So there's your little shortcut. Yes, that, correct, Joe. And that's the other way to look at it is like a clock, it starts at the top and goes around clockwise. Top, right, bottom, left, and that's the order of doing the shortcut code. Top, right, bottom, left. Once again, most pros tend to use this approach when they're doing any sort of like around the clock or trouble, top, right, bottom, left stuff. Um, so what I could do with the code that I've created here, instead of doing top, bottom, and left, you know, I'm not worried about the right, why? Because my stuff doesn't even reach that far, right? But I'm gonna comment out this code. Once again, I'm leaving it here so I can see what I've done before. And I'm gonna switch to the shortcut approach. And then I'm gonna do top was 10 pixels. Right, well, I didn't apply anything to the right. I'm just gonna say zero pixels. I can do that. The bottom was 10. And left was 30. And you know what, 30 might not even be enough. I'm gonna go 40, heck, why not? Okay. I'm gonna save that. Let's jump over to the browser, do a refresh. Okay, moved a little bit over, but same effect. Okay, and that's the shortcut approach. A lot of the, the styling things that deal with objects and the kind of like that two-dimensional space where we have where it wraps all the way around the object, we can individually control each side like that, and there's always a short code for doing it too. If you're not sure of like what the short code method is, spell it all out. Doesn't matter. Doesn't matter to the browser as long as it happens. What'll happen though is with most professionals, they tend to go to the short code approach first because it's quicker. All right. Now, one of the things that they do here is they, they give you a little hands-on practice. And notice what they're applying this to. They're doing it to the H2. You, you could try this approach if you want. Um, you know, the only thing that I like in what they did here that's different than what I did is um, they, they centered the text. And I think that might actually look pretty good on, on this if this was centered. So I'm going to go to my style sheet, and what was that? That was the H2, and the command for centering it, of course, was text align center and a semicolon. But otherwise, I think we've kind of effectively tried all these things, so that, that's my change. They also put a background color on it. You know, I'll leave that up to you. Right now, I'm pretty happy with how this looks. I think it looks kind of all, all right, for as simple as it is. All right now, we're going to move to uh, the next topic area, which is, I you know, a really important one, because the web is a visual medium, folks, right? And we want to put pictures on our web pages because pictures communicate a lot of information very quickly and efficiently. Um, you know, they say a picture is worth a thousand words. I could maybe argue maybe even more, you know, depending on what the picture is of. Um, and there's certain formats that we typically use on web pages for displaying images. And, and the three most common ones are the ones that you see listed here. Now you may have seen these file formats before from working with graphics programs or maybe from previous you know, base level HTML work. <clears throat> it just depends on where you come from. Typically when you take a picture on like your smartphone or a, or a camera, 
<coughs> the, the pictures get compressed before they come to a computer screen, and typically that's in the format of a JPEG. So photographs tend to be in a JPEG format. Now the other two formats have all of their certain capabilities, and we're, we're going to go format by format and talk about those capabilities, because there are better choices for certain things than others depending on what you're doing. Okay, But right off the bat, we know that JPEGs are probably best for a regular photograph. So keep that in mind. So let's hit the first format, which is called a GIF. Now, interesting thing about GIFs, <coughs> GIFs are technically a proprietary format. Okay, so what, what does that mean? It's a file type that was developed by a company for putting images on the web before it was a thing to put images on the web. All right, so way back in the old days, before we had like proper internet, we used to have what we called bulletin board services. Okay, so just for example, um, okay, one way that you could get on the web in the old days, or at least you thought you were getting on the web, so let me clarify that, is you'd like get a service like AOL, okay? Or back when I first got on the internet, I tried a service called Prodigy, right? And then there's a different service called CompuServe, okay? And they were all competing services, but really when you would dial in, you would connect to a system that was kind of closed. It really didn't even connect to the internet. It just kind of seemed like you were, because there were other users on there and there was content you could look at. And the people that ran CompuServe figured out, wouldn't it be cool if we could put pictures on there? Hmm. So they developed this file format called GIF for the CompuServe service. And then of course, everybody started hacking it, figuring out the file format, and they kind of stole it from CompuServe. But technically, it still belongs to CompuServe. You know, however, nobody really cares much these days about all that history, um, and it's just one of the basic file formats, and it was like the first one that we saw on the web. All right, it is really best for a couple of different things. So if you have an image that really does not have a lot of colors in it, and is, you know, uh, kind of like a simplistic image. So here's an example. Maybe like the logo for a company might be just a couple of colors or one color you know so it's kind of you know in essence kind of like almost a binary thing like there's a color with a white background we're done you know um, it can be a very efficient file format because it does low color resolution really well notice there's a maximum of 256 colors it can display which is not a very big color palette so if you're trying to do like um, the picture of the sky and the sky goes from this like deep purple to a red to a yellow or you know like you see like a beautiful sunset and there's all these changes of colors and not good for that at all you know because it would not show the increment or the gradient of color changing because it doesn't have enough color definition to do that if I was just putting a coca-cola logo on the screen which is red and white perfect two colors piece of cake the other thing that's kind of interesting about the, the GIF format is it also allows for transparency. So here's what that means. Typically when you're working with an image, an image will usually be in a kind of a square shape, regardless of whether that image contains a circle or not. And so what they're showing you here is, if I save the GIF without transparency, in other words, the background would come with the letters. So when I would put it up on the screen, I would see the background with the letters. But if I opted to just have a GIF image that just contained letters, and I didn't want the background, so the background of what's there can show through, then I would save it with transparency. And that's one of the really big things that GIFs bring to us is the fact that you can have that transparency. So I can put whatever image is on the screen, and even though it's square, it might not fill the whole box and I can see through it to whatever's behind it and that can create really cool visual effects. This is kind of a primitive example but I can see past the text to the background. Without transparency I can't, I have to see the background too. So that's a big thing. The other thing that's kind of neat about GIFs is they also have the capability to have multiple image states which allows for kind of like animation. Okay, hmm. So if you ever like have been out on the web and found like an animated GIF, you can find them out there where it's like an image and it looks like it's like moving or whatever and it's still an image file, GIFs allow for that. 
So that's kind of cool. So if you're not, if you've never seen an animated GIF, you might just want to, you know, type in examples of animated GIFs, you know, and you know, hit hit a website, you know. Okay, so that, that's an animated GIF. It's technically it's one image, but really what it is is multiple image states saved into one file, and it gives you something that you don't otherwise get, which is motion on the screen. So in the early days when they came up with this, and it could be transparent, and you could put mixed up move, it was like, holy cow, this is cool, you know? It is a little bit antiquated looking, frankly, I think at this point, um, depending on how you do it. So, you know, simple little ones like that are okay. I'm not seeing the, the example there. Right, okay, so here's an example of one that's moving a little bit. And, and what it is, it just draws your attention. I tend to think though, and, and this is opinion, mind you, that animated GIFs are not appropriate for all situations. So for example, if I was doing a business site, I really don't want a lot of that on my business site because I'm really trying to get like down to the nitty gritty of doing my business and, and you know, doing what my business does. However, if I was, you know, showing, if I was like on a kid's website where there's a lot of games and stuff and I want to get the kids to click on something, I might do it. Or if I'm putting up like a, like a silly meme on Facebook, I might do it. But I don't think it's appropriate in all situations. And, in, and, and it's kind of honestly frowned upon in some ways from a design standpoint, because it looks so like 1990s, frankly, the animation. But it can be used creatively. So I'm not saying don't, but I'm saying be really selective and careful about the usage because frankly, it can be kind of obnoxious. And nothing speaks unprofessional as much as obnoxious. <laughs> and I'm gonna show you an example of obnoxious and remind me to show you this uh, before we leave today of like an example of a website that's kind of obnoxious that actually kind of works for it. All right, so then we move to the JPEG format. And the JPEG format is the one that really is best for photographs, period, because most of our devices that take photographs will tend to save your files in, in this format. It is a compressed format, though. So whenever you take a picture with a camera, <coughs> most of our smartphones tend to not do it unless you have like a cutting edge device. There's a difference, you know, because when we would use film, the thing about film is it's actually capturing light and embedding it on a physical piece of media. And in theory, it is infinite detail. And that's kind of fascinating to think about because it is an analog medium. When, whenever we're dealing with a photograph, no matter how nice that photograph is, and I know I do not have a lot of photographs on this machine, so this is, you know, usually I use my personal machine to like teach a class like this. And right now I'm, I'm trying to jump to my file folder. For whatever reason, it's just not letting me do it. Oh, no wonder it's on the other screen. <laughs> um, and I'm just gonna give you an example here uh, somewhere. All right, and I don't have a lot of pictures on here. Okay, this is really embarrassing. <laughs> All right, I, <laughs> All right. so I'm gonna show you this and this is, this is bad because it's going in a video. So we were goofing around in class the other night and I was showing people how to make <laughs> a profile picture, right? And because this is a photograph I took with my laptop, all right? And I don't know if this is, this is a JPEG. It is a JPEG. But the thing about JPEGs and, and all photographs, if you have the capability to actually zoom in, and that's really horrible to look at, all right, so that's not even the best way to, to zoom in. What I'm going to do is I'm actually going to open it with... Um, Photoshop. So I'm going to launch <coughs> Photoshop on my machine here because it has the capability to infinitely zoom in. And I want to show you something that's true about graphics that you might not know about. Maybe you do. And it's not to belittle whatever knowledge you're coming in with. That's not my point here. But it's really to kind of show you some really important concepts about images. And this is, you know, like I said, it's embarrassing to put your own photograph in there. Uh, especially uh, to this degree, 
But with Photoshop, I can keep zooming in to the point where I can see the individual pixels that make up the picture. So whenever you take a digital image, you know, and you talk about like how many megapixels your camera is, what they're doing is they're counting the total number of individual little tiny squares across and down and multiplying it and getting a number. So if you have like a 10 megapixel camera, that means there's like 10 million picture or pixels per picture. It's kind of insane to think about. And the higher the megapixel, the greater the resolution. All right? So all images are broken down into these pixels. Also, all of our screens do the same thing. If you could zoom in far enough on your screen, you would see, like on my screen, this is a 1920 by 1080 resolution on my screen. So I have 1,920 pixels going across and 1,080 pixels top to bottom. Now each pixel in a photograph like this, I don't know if you're noticing, but it only contains one color. It's that, that ability, as I'm zooming out, at least I thought I was zooming out, Oh yeah, that's right. It's an alt click to zoom out. So each one is just one single color and it's the combination of those pixels that horrify... <laughs> There's my nostrils. That's really wonderful. <laughs> Sorry, that's probably the, the worst photograph I've ever used as an example, but there it is. Um, but the point is, that's how all images on computer screens operate. All photographs regardless of their resolution, are broken down into these little pixels. The problem is, if I take a photograph, and I'm just going to give you an example here, I'm going to log into my, uh, my personal Gmail account here, where I upload photos directly from my camera. They all just like immediately go up into the cloud here. And I'm just trying to find uh, something that's not embarrassing to look at. <laughs> Frankly, all right, there's a picture of my daughter. Let's find something kind of neutral. All right, let's take a picture of, you know, like a picture of flowers on the hill. All right, and I took this with my camera, automatically uploads to Google. I'm going to download it back to my machine so I have it here that I can work with. And now that I've downloaded it, I can open it up in the file folder. And this is a, a habit you're going to get into when you guys are working with images. You need to know the file format, you need to know the resolution, and you need to know how big you end up needing to make it on your page. And so there's some tips and techniques here that you need to kind of focus in on. So you notice I'm just hovering over the file right now in Windows, and Windows automatically will give me some basic information about the file just by hovering. First of all, look at the file size. That's listed at the bottom. It's 1.87 megabytes. All right, that is compressed. It's not the original size that was, that's on my phone. It's compressed, but that's still huge. You do not want your files to be that big on a web page because every time you're loading it, that person's got to download that file. And no matter how small I make it on the screen, it's still downloading the whole file. And more importantly, let me go back to that again and hover. Look at the, look at the pixel dimension. 4,000 whatever by 2,200. How big was my screen? So what I'm telling you is if I put that, that picture at full resolution up on the screen, it would fill this whole wall. That's way bigger than what I need for any web page. I do not need that resolution. Okay, so we're going to talk about how to size photographs, but one real common thing when you're pulling in photographs or graphics is you have to make sure that it's not too big file size and it's not too big pixel size because frankly on the web you just do not need it. If I had a 4K TV, it would fit. I don't, right? I have a HD display here which is greater than what most people have on most of the devices that they look at web pages. That's the other issue. Most surfing is done on phones and tablets. So scaling down your images becomes very important. We're going to come back to this image, but 
JPEGs are our best for photographs. They are a compressed format. Notice though they cannot be animated and they cannot be made transparent. Yes? Okay, excellent question. So I'm not seeing that, oh yeah, it uses lossy compression. That means that some information in the process of compression, some of the data is lost. That's what it means. If you use a lossless compression, the theory is, is that you've compressed it to make it smaller, but you can decompress it and put it right back to full resolution. The only image format that allows you to do that is the raw format that you get on high-end digital cameras. And instead of creating an image that's maybe two, four, five, ten megabytes a picture, you'll have pictures that are like 60 megabytes each. Yeah, they, they get huge, really fast. Correct. Yeah, it does not modify. It. Yeah, th that's the whole thing. And it, what it does is it tries to eliminate some of the space in the file, make it smaller without losing the data. That that lossless and lossy compression is actually an issue with audio files too. We'll talk about that as well. Let's move on to the PNG format, which kind of has become the new standard, uh, frankly, for a lot of people, because it kind of combines the best of both worlds. First of all, it allows for more color display. Did you notice that with JPEGs, you can do 16.7 million colors, basically as much as can be displayed on a computer screen by default? So the full color spectrum, in, in essence, is available to you. 16.7 million colors should be enough to kind of recreate reality. But the reality of reality is, reality is analog, folks. Digital is always an approximation of reality. That's why some purists still believe that film is a better format. That's why some people still prefer vinyl over CDs. Because they're analog formats and actually have infinite information embedded into them. Digital is always an approximation. So, The PNG format that's kind of cool though, is it does support millions of colors. It does support animation and transparency. However, if you are going to do photos, and this is kind of a fair warning, JPEGs are more efficient than PNGs in file size. So if you need a large photograph on a web page, go to JPEG. Small image, PNGs are fine. You need transparency and animation, you're either going to do GIF or PNG. A lot of our tools these days, like screen capture tools, or um, you know, like a lot of the photo editing software you use will often export to PNGs by default. Um, you know, and if I was to pick one for general usage, PNG is typically what I'll go to. But always for a photograph, I go to JPEGs. Are there other formats that you can use? <clears throat> you know what? Yes, because there's many other file formats for, for graphics. A lot of them aren't really heavily used anymore. The, the most common one that you might see aside from these are called TIFFs. And TIFFs are completely uncompressed images by default. So they tend to be the highest resolution ones. There's also the raw format. But usually those three will cover uh, most of your needs. All right, so now we have to deal with the, with the let's get this on the page factor, all right? And um, they, there's a pretty simple approach for doing it. Here's the, the overall approach. Um, and notice that we have a new tag called image or IMG. Then I'm going to go ahead and first do a little bit of file management. You guys catching me here? That's where we're going to start. And this is pretty important. So I'm going to go to the file folder where my work is located. And I'm going to open it up. And here's my current working project. Now I could just take the image and throw it right into the folder. However, not a good idea. Because usually when you do a website, you end up having a bunch of images. And then all of a sudden you got a folder that, you know, you got like 50 pictures in there and 10 web pages, and then you're looking for stuff and you can't find it. So what most designers do is this. They usually create a folder inside their project and call it 
images or pics or whatever. My standard is I always call it images, lowercase. That's my standard, so I always know where to type in the code or what, what co or what folders to look in. But you can call it whatever you want. Just be consistent. But I call mine images lowercase. Now, I'm actually going to take that image that I downloaded before, assuming I can find it. There it is. And I'm going to drag and drop it into the folder. And it is right now it is full resolution, mind you. Okay? And I'm leaving it that way on purpose. Now, I'm going to tell you what. That's the name that came off of my phone, which is the date and the time I took it. I, not very useful, right? I'm going to change it. I'm going to rename it and call it Flowers on Hill. Notice, no spaces. You guys catching this? The other thing I'm doing is all lowercase. These are just conventions that I use. Don't put spaces in your file names on the web, folks, or in your folder names. Try to get in that habit. All right? If you don't, I'll, I'll usually put little comments in your homework about it. So, But now I have a name I can remember. Now I'm going to go over to my code. And you know what? I'm not going to put this on my index page. In fact, I think what I'm going to do is I'm going to put it on my about page. And I am remembering that on both this page, I'm getting rid of those now. And on my contact page, I'm going to do the same thing. Save and save. And I think I'm going to, I'm going to put this on my about page. I, you know, I'm not really sure where I'm going to put it, but it's going to probably be somewhere around here. In fact, you know what? Here's a, a paragraph, right? And it just says, this is the about page. Well, well thank you very much. I guess it is. Um, but you know what? I'm going to put a line break in here. And then I'm going to throw my image tag right here. So I'm going to do IMG. And the, the, the most important part of the image tag is this, SRC, which is what is your source file? And so here I'm going to type where it is. Now, higher end tools, I think Brackets does this, I think Visual Studio Code does this, um, Notepad++ does not do this, just so you know, will give you a way to actually like browse to it, select the file, and it just drops in the right code. Okay, so I'm going to, I'll demonstrate that. I'm just going to choose it and say okay, and it just drops it in. Okay, that's really cool. You know why that's really cool? Because you're not making any mistakes, and you know it will work. That's one reason why you might want to use a higher end tool. If you didn't know it though, so I'm just going to pretend like, all right, whatever, my tool doesn't do this, I have to type it in manually. I would actually go be, I would be looking here, I'm like, okay, relative to my index page, or my about page actually, it's inside the images folder and here's the name of it. Okay, and I'll try to remember it and put it in my head, then I come back over here and I type images first, because that's the folder, a forward slash, and then the name of the file, and hopefully I type it right, so I'm going to type flower dash on Hill, and those of you that are sharp already know that I made a mistake, but I'm making the mistake on purpose. Because that's not the right file name. Right? And this is the kind of thing that's going to happen when you guys are coding by hand. Is you'll screw up little things like this, and the image won't show up, and then I'll be getting an email going, Oh my god, it didn't work. I don't know what I'm doing wrong. Oh my god, I want to kill myself. No. <laughs> no, hopefully not. Right? It's not, remember, this is IT. You, we always have an undo and a redo, and it, we're not like saving lives here. We're just creating web pages. So, one little tip I give students is this. If you're working manually, you can always go to your file, right click, rename, and then notice the JPEG part's not highlighted, but I'm just going to hold down my shift key and right arrow, select the rest of it, and then I'm just going to do control C to copy, and then I can go to my code, and you know what, I know I'm not going to mistype it because I copied it right from the file name. Now, the, the higher end tools which automatically select the file for you and drop it in, I mean, that's basically what they're doing, right? It's just somebody programmed it in so you don't have to do the work. So, if you switch to a higher end editor, that's one of the, one of the benefits. All right. Now, believe it or not, the book shows you that there's other code you can throw in, 
But that is enough to actually get it on the page, it's just that. Image and source. All right, I'm gonna save this, and now I'm gonna go back to the browser and load it up, and where is it? There's the browser, and where's my Mr. Robot page? I'm gonna hit, wait, it's on the About page, right? Did I save my About page? Yes, I did, just wanna make sure. Now I'm gonna do a refresh, no, no, I'm going to just go to the About page, and there's my image. And you know what? It's pretty damn big. <laughs> it's full resolution. Oh my God. You don't want to do this to people, do you? <laughs> so this is my example of why you can't use like pictures straight off your camera on a website, folks. You just can't do it. I mean, you can, but it's like, um, you know... <laughs> Not, not a good idea, right? Not very effective. And I'm also loading two megabytes of information. Now think about this. Two megabytes, you're sitting here at Gateway, you're plugged into a high-speed network, we're getting probably like at least 300 megabits down here, at least, if not higher, per connection, you know. So that image, even though it's two megabytes, is like, boom, it's there. If you're on your cell phone, though, and let's say you're not like in downtown Racine. You're like, I don't know, in Franksville or something. <laughs> not picking on Franksville people, but I know their bandwidth up there isn't the greatest. And your phone's not even on 4G, it's on 3G. Or heck, it's on 1X, right? You guys ever get that effect? And it's like modem speeds. That image is going to load like a one pixel row at a time on your screen in a painfully agonizing manner. And then what happens is, you know, you're waiting for the image to load and what you've done, meanwhile, is you're down here reading whatever is coming next. And then when the image is finish, finishes loading, it pushes your text out of the way on top of it. So frustrating. So you as a, as, as a designer have to think about these things. You've got to make your images efficient. So here's what I'm going to coach you on how to do. You do not need to get a fancy tool like Photoshop to do what I'm about to do. Both the Macs operating system and the PC operating system have built-in editing tools that allow you to resize photographs without spending money. So one thing you can do is this. You can take that image, and I, I'm on a Windows machine obviously, and I'm going to choose open with, and you can choose paint or paint 3D, it, it doesn't matter. Windows 10, the later versions of Windows, Windows 10 have this tool called paint 3D, which is a revamp of paint. But you can, frankly, you can just use the paint tool. That, that's actually fine for resizing images. And once the image is loaded up, notice they have a little resize button on the ribbon bar. If you're not seeing the ribbon bar because it's like this, you just come up here and click that little down arrow. Choose resize. And then notice what it'll do is it'll show you kind of what you're going to do here. All right. So a couple really key things if you're going to resize images. Instead of working off of percentages, because that's what they have selected right now, instead switch to pixels. Okay. As a designer, you should first be aware of what your screen resolution is. <coughs> How do you know what your screen resolution is? Let's talk about that. Well, hit your Windows key and D, right click on an open area of your desktop and choose display settings. When the dialog comes up, scroll down and notice what your display resolution is. Mine for a laptop is fairly high, and most modern laptops usually default to this. I'm looking at Joe right now because I know he's got a MacBook Pro, right, probably? What's your resolution? 15-inch. Oh, but the resolution. Yeah, I know, because you got one of those retina displays and it's much, much higher. But you as users, you know, as coders, really need to be acutely aware of this, especially for web design. Um, and, you know, most people's screens will typically be like 1366 by 768, maybe down here, uh, maybe 1600 by 900, somewhere in that range, most laptops, especially budget laptops. Better quality laptops will have much higher resolution. Um, so you need to kind of keep that all in mind as you're working. Going back over here to paint though, 
I'm looking at this and going, you know what? I know my screen's only 1920 wide, and that's actually pretty wide for a laptop. So I might want to actually scale this back down to like 400. So I'm, gonna, I'm just going to choose 400. I want you to notice that I also have this box checked here which says maintain aspect ratio. And what that means is as I change the one dimension, the other one changes automatically with it in proportion. The last thing you want to do is change it disproportionately because then what happens is your, is your image gets stretched and skewed and looks horrible. So always leave that box checked if you're changing photographs. Okay. Now that I have it shrunk down a little bit, I'm going to say OK. And that's the net effect. All right. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm, instead of saving it, I'm actually going to do a save as. I'm going to save it back to a JPEG. And I'm going to give it a different name. In fact, I'm just going to append to it dash small. And I have a strategy here. This allows me to leave the original one intact in case this didn't work or I don't like the, the effect of it. And notice where I saved it. I totally saved it to the wrong spot. Sorry. So <laughs> let me do that again uh, and then take it to the right location. So I want to put it back in that images folder. And save. All right, I can get paint out of the way now. And I can go back over to my engine here. And actually, all I have to do is change the file call, right? So I'm just going to add dash SM, which for me means small. That's just a convention I do. You can name it whatever you want, but that's what I do. Okay, Saving it. Now I'm going to go back to my browser again. I'm going to reload the same page. And boom. All right, that I can live with. All right. You might argue I could make it bigger smaller, whatever, but it's on the page and it's reasonable. I, the other thing I want you to look at though is go to that file folder and take a look at the difference in the file size. I went from two megabytes almost down to 87K. I might even argue that 87K is still too high. Okay, But that's going to load that much faster. So if, if a user is using a slow connection, which happens a lot on mobile devices, folks, even on Wi-Fi, because like think about this, you walk into like McDonald's or something, get on their Wi-Fi, you think they're giving you like full tilt internet? They're, they're, they're throttling it down. You're not getting full speed. And that image is going to load much faster than the other one that I had. Now why is this important? Because in the slideshow here, they start to talk about these other attributes. Okay, so let's talk about them and add them in because these are all pretty important. The first thing that you should know is whenever you're working with HTML5, HTML5 requires as part of its standard that you always include an alt tag to describe your image. Okay, if you omit it, whenever you go to the validator on W3Schools, it's going to squawk at you and say, uh, it, you're missing the alt tag and uh, HTML5 recommends blah, 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 blah. And you're like, okay, fine, fine, fine. And so what some people do is they just put an empty one in. Okay, there's a reason why you should fill it in though. Google is basically it. When, when search engines are crawling your site, they look at the alt tag to see what the image is. So you might want to say image of flowers on the hill. Right? You could just do something like that. Or I might just say flowers. Whatever. Exactly. It is also good for disability uh, people because, you know, think about this. Some people surf the web without being able to see. You know, like, what? Yeah. They have what they call screen readers. And so, like, if the image pops up in their screen reader, and they're scrolling down, it'll read out to them, image of flowers. If it's blank, it won't say anything. The other reason, if your image, for some reason, let's say it gets deleted from the server accidentally, this will pop up in the spot where the image is supposed to be. That text will pop up and tell you what it's supposed to be. 
So that's why it might not be a bad idea to just say image of flowers on a hill. That's considered good practice. The other good practice considered is to also put the height of the image in pixels and the width of the image in pixels. Now what I like to do with these as a rule, and I want you guys to really latch onto this concept because I think it's really important. One mistake I see a lot of students making is they'll take that full resolution image and they'll put it on the screen and go, you know, that's too big. Then they come here and with the height and the width, they can control the size of the image on the screen. However, they're still loading the big file. Okay, so I'm just going to give you an example. I'm going to put in a really ridiculously small height and width, and I'm just guessing at the numbers. And watch what happens in the browser. It will become small. But did you also notice that it's totally out of proportion now? You know, I can also do the converse. I can make it much bigger. So I can, like, instead of 400, I could do, like, 840 by, oh, I don't know what the math is. You know, this is, and this is what people do. They go, like, 500, oh, that's good enough. Or, yeah, 599, if that's fine. He'll never know. You know, a trained eye sees it right away. That's not right. See what happened is I could change the size of the image. Well, what happened to it? It's, like, distorted. And this is a picture of flowers, so you can't kind of really tell. But if it's like a person's face, or like some, you know, picture of like a building or something, it's like, oh my God, what did they do to that picture? So the rule of thumb that I'd like you to follow is this. Whatever the dimensions of your image turn out to be, and we're working with the small one, right? So it's 400 by 225. Those are the numbers you should enter here. 400 by 225. Let your graphics program do the resizing correctly. Then you read the, the image details and type it in. Now the reason that we put the height and the width tags in there is because while the image is loading, it reserves the space on the screen for the image before it loads. So you eliminate the effect of what I was talking about before, where you're reading some text and an image loads and it pushes your text out of the way. It won't do that if you put the height and the width in there. It's considered good practice to do that, but don't try to control the size of your image with the height and the width tag. Use your graphics program to do that and use this only to reserve the screen space. This is a lesson hard learned by me in the past, and I think most people kind of latch on to that pretty quickly these days, uh, fortunately. And did I save this? Nope, I didn't, so let's save it. Let's go back and refresh. Well, that's not right either, is it? Oh, I put them in the wrong spot. Did you see? I switched them. Yeah. My bad. <laughs> yeah, but that's a great example, too, of like how you can mess up your picture, right? Now it should be okay. All right, so now it's back to the right aspect ratio. You know, if you want to make like minor tweaks in size, you better make sure that your math is right. I'm just warning you, right? Because most people don't get the math right. That's why I let a graphics program do it for you. Right, moving on. Is that the example like a lossy compression or it wouldn't be? No, this is not compression at all. Not compression at all. No, not compression at all. Okay. This is like resizing. Mm -hmm. All right, it's so what uh, Joe was mentioning before. We have to put the alt tag in with HTML5, otherwise it won't validate right. Um, but you know, they do also make the recommend recommendation if it's purely a decorative image, has no impact on like the content, you might want to leave it empty. Yeah, so, but if your image does not load, so I'm gonna give you an example of that too. And the way that I'm gonna give you the example is I'm gonna take this file and just rename it so that the file name's wrong. So when the browser goes to try to load the image, see what happened? Gives a little icon, it's supposed to be an image, and then my alt text comes up and says, image of flowers on a hill. 
Let me give you another little tip. I'm going to fix that first, of course. And sometimes that happens, you know, files get deleted on servers by mistake or people rename them or move them accidentally. Here's another little tip that I think is pretty helpful. And it, you know, it is in our book somewhere farther down the line. But often when I put images on a page, I also do this. I put in a title attribute, right? And I say, maybe I'll say the same thing. Image of flowers blooming on the hill, you know, or whatever. And, and if you save that, and then go back to your browser, do a refresh. Now watch what happens when I move my mouse over the picture. I think that's kind of cool too. That title thing, you can put that on any HTML, HTML element you want. But I think it's particularly useful for pictures. Very simple to do, but pretty powerful. Nice little trick. <clears throat> now the other beautiful thing about this is we can take these images and we can create links around them. So the anchor tags that we were wrapping around text, we can also start to wrap around images. And this is where it gets fun, I think. So now my theme on this site is Mr. Robot and here I am putting pictures of flowers on there. Um, so you know what, I'm going to go do a little photo hunting. You guys cool with that, right? This is for educational purposes only, by the way. <laughs> I have to say that because normally if you go out and you, you download pictures of people's copyrighted content, it's considered a huge no-no. And you can get a whole lot of trouble and lawsuits that come with it. So you never use somebody else's original artwork without permission. In education, we get a pass. All right, but the tip that comes with that is, What's really good is either you're going to start working with graphic designers or photographers or you learn how to do some of those things yourself. And that's not a bad skill to pick up. A little bit of Photoshop, a little bit of you know, photo editing. You know, everybody's got a smartphone now so it's easy to take pictures. It's not hard to do. You're better off usually having your own original image for any website. But I'm looking at my, my page here and you know what? That Mr. Robot thing at the top is all well and cool and all that, but you know what would be a whole lot cooler? Is how about I actually get the logo from the USA Network for Mr. Robot? I mean, because, you know, I want it to look like a real fan page. So, you know what? I'm going to go out to Google, like everybody does, and I'm just going to type Mr. Robot. And, you know, they're just about to fire up season four on this, I think, this weekend. And what I'm going to do here is I'm actually going to go. So I typed in the search results, and I'm going to go to the images section of the search results. And Google has a, a pretty sophisticated set of like search tools now for looking for images. And what I'm going to do is I, I actually want the logo, so I, I should probably qualify and say logo. I'm typing that in. All right, now this is what we're talking about, all right? So I'm thinking maybe that one of these Mr. Robots would look really good across the top of the screen. Um, so I, I'm going to look at this and try to find one that I think is a nice, clean logo. Oh my God, there's so many to choose from. Okay, well this one says, I'm looking at the description, right? It says cropped Mr. Robot TV logo PNG one. You know, hey, let's go. Let's go check that out. I'm also noticing, you guys looking at this image, and I don't know if you can make it out on your screens or not, but if you look really, really closely at this, you can kind of see a checkered board pattern in the background. That's the indication that it's a transparent image. You know, that's the one I want. It's got just the letters, I can see through them, so whatever background I have behind it is going to look really, it's going to come through. So if I choose like a different color or image or whatever, it's all going to shine through. So, you know, this is the one I want. So what I'm going to do, you guys notice what it says here? Images may be subject to copyright. Nah, who cares? It's, it's the internet. We'll just grab it all for free, right? Yeah. You know what? Professionally, wrong answer. 
it is really bad and people get really pissed and you know what they have lawyers that come after you big companies that lawyers that will scare the, the pants right off of you for stealing their stuff so you got to be really careful sometimes they'll give a pass to like fan content I was yes say also, can you just offer to pay them to use their content? sure you'd be surprised what they ask sometimes you'd be surprised that's for a while. they might they might say that's fine but just create some links back to our site and they might say yeah that's fine some people will say, oh, okay, a thousand bucks. And then you're like, oh, yeah, no thanks. <laughs> I'll just type it in a font, you know? And then they can't really say anything about it at that point. <laughs> now, the beauty of like the, the Google image search tool here is that once you have the image up on the screen like this, you can actually just do a right click and, and save image as, which is exactly what I'm going to do. I'm going to grab this. And I'm going to put it in that same folder I've been working in. Let's see if I can find this here. And let's save it. All right, so it's in my, uh, my images folder. And now I'm going to go back to my page here. And here's where I'm going to start to change things a little bit, folks. Since I'm going to be putting in an image for my header, I'm actually going to be dropping it up here. So I'm actually going to get rid of my H1. Yep. And then I'm going to do a couple things. So this is a little strange. First thing I'm going to do is I'm actually going to create a div. And I'm going to put uh, an ID on it and call it logo box. That's what I'm going to call it. Okay, so I created my div. Now I'm going to create my image inside of that thing. The reason I'm doing this is by putting it inside the div, it encapsulates it. And by encapsulating it in the div, I have an extra layer of graphical control over the appearance of it. So I can put borders around it, padding around it, color the background separately. And this is, I'm kind of leading to something. And, and you'll see it as I, as I go. So I'm going to do my source. I'm going to browse. There's my logo. I'm going to say OK. I'm not really too worried right now about like uh, what the size of it is, but I'll come back in the aftermath and, and fix that. So I'll say Alt, um, Mr. Robot Logo. Right? That's what it is. May as well say it. Um, I'm not going to put a title tag on it, but you know what? That, that's enough for right now just to get it on the screen. Let's save it. This is on the About page. You guys noticing that? It's not on all my pages yet, just on the About page. So now I'm going to go uh, to my browser, if I can find it on my screen. Oh, it's right here. <laughs> all right, let's try that again. And there's my page. I'm going to go to About, and hey, looking pretty good, right? Whole lot, whole lot better. And you know what? I'm not even close to what I want to do with this yet, all right? So I'm just giving you guys ideas. So one of the first things I might do with this is this. I'm going to go ahead and do a little styling now. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this, this logo box that I created. And notice I put an ID on this one, not a class, because I really only expect to use it once. So I'm going to copy that definition over to my style sheet. And because it appears towards the top of my page, I'm going to put it towards the top of my CSS. That's another pattern that I use. This is a class, excuse me, an ID. So with an ID, to attach a style to it, you always have to start with a hashtag or a pound sign. And I'm going to paste in the name. And notice how I didn't type it in. I copy pasted it in because I know I'm not going to make a mistake. So these are just common sense techniques. Put in my curly brackets. First thing I'm going to do is, you know what? Background. What color am I going to make it? Black, for sure, because it's Mr. Robot and that's kind of the thing. Right? I'm also going to put a little padding on it to make it a little more comfortable looking. I'm going to go 20 pixels, give it a little bit of space. And I'm also going to align the content. I'm actually going to do uh, text align center and the first thing you should ask is but it's not text it's an image it doesn't matter it's still center it all right let's go back and take a look now 
to refresh. Boom. What do you think? Pretty sharp, I think. I must say so myself. Now I'm not liking that cream colored background anymore. <laughs> right? You see the kind of stuff that, you know, is, as you do this stuff, you're like, well, now I want to change this. Now I want to change that. Wouldn't it be cool if I did this? And if your head's thinking like that, you guys are doing the right thing. Because that's what you should be thinking, is every little change you make is going to make some sort of an inspiration or something for you to do something additional. But for me, I think that looks fantastic. You know, I think it really is a significant improvement. Um, a, another real common thing we do, especially with like logos on web pages, folks, is when we start doing that type of thing, very often we also make the logo on a web page a link back to the home page, right? You guys, I mean, that's kind of a common thing we think about. You know, I already have one of those links created right here. Why don't I just copy that and I'll put it around my image tag. I have to remember to close that tag right here. I'm going to go back to my about page, do a refresh, and now when I hover, now I can click and go back to my home page where I don't have the logo yet. And what an improvement it is, right? Okay, so let's, let's go back now and take that whole little section, that div that I created. I'm going to copy it, and then I'm going to put it on each one of my pages in place of the H1. And then of course, we've got to do it on the main page. Oop, it didn't delete, but let's delete it. Save it. And refresh. So now it's on my home page. It's on my about page. It's on my con... Well, oh, it's not on my contact page. Did I not save that one? Yeah, it did not save that one. So save. Refresh. There it is. Okay. Just an example. All right, uh, we covered a lot of stuff right there, uh, and I know we got a little bit of time left, so I'm trying to see if I can get most of the way through this PowerPoint. Uh, we talked about some of this stuff. We talked about image optimization, right? Some tips from the author. They also point out some free tools. If you don't want to use Paint or the Preview tool on a Mac to change your image size, they do make some recommendations. Adobe Photoshop, obviously, that you have to pay for that. GIMP, however, if you search GIMP, that's a free photo editor that works on all platforms, Mac, PC, and Linux. Um, completely free, and it's kind of like Photoshop, the way Photoshop used to be, like old school uh, Photoshop. Uh, and it works really well, and I know some people swear by it. I've never been a huge fan, but I, I do usually load it up on my systems. And I do know that it's loaded up on all the machines in the labs here. So that's something to know. This other one <clears throat> I do recommend that's pretty cool is Pixlr. It's a, it's a web-based uh, tool. Other thing you could do is you could also upload your image to your Google Drive and use the Google Draw program to resize your photographs. I don't recommend that as much. I would rather see you use Pixlr over that one. All right. Other tips we've already talked about. When you name things, my recommendation and the author's is to use all lowercase letters because then you know it's all lowercase letters. You don't have to be guessing. Do not use punctuation symbols and spaces in file names as well. It's just a general rule of thumb. And don't change the file extensions of the image because some cameras, depending on your device, will save JPEGs as JPEG don't change it. Leave it as whatever it is. Another thing that I see as a problem sometimes, and I'm going to show you this kind of on the fly here, is like sometimes people use a snipping tool. They'll go to a website, find an image they like, and they do this, right? And then they go to save it so they can use it on their web page. And they save it. Do you guys notice what, what happened to the file extension? Capital letters. Yeah. You have to put those capital letters in your code, otherwise that image won't show. You use lowercase in your code, it won't show. So usually, what I tell people is like if you're using the snipping tool to grab something, do this, change it. 
keep you know keep it consistent, basically. Right. Other thing we are already kind of talked about is this: organizing your site. So what happens is you know you start getting a lot of images, and it's not unusual for a website. In some cases, they have thousands of images. I did like some e-commerce sites. And I, I, I recall, I have a couple of recollections of like one was like, like 40,000 images, you know, on, on one site. And if you get to that many, what you're going to find is you'll have an images folder and then you'll start breaking it into categories. You know, like, I don't know, product, I don't know, widgets, you know, food, whatever, whatever your categories are. So that, that's kind of a, a useful thing. All right couple new elements that we're going to talk about um, and instead of like really going into a lot of depth talking about these I'm just going to try to copy and paste the code right out of the PowerPoint here if it lets me okay once again it's not letting me so I got to type this in <coughs> I, I, I opened this without turning on editing right is that what the problem was probably um, in fact you know what I'm not going to demonstrate this one I, I'm just going to kind of let the PowerPoint speak for itself because I'm looking at the clock and this is a thing that um, is kind of new in HTML5 as well. I'm not a huge user of this one, frankly, but I, I do see that some sites do use it quite a bit. But they created this tag called figure, which allows you to kind of combine an image and its text description into one container and then style it. So you use the figure tag on the outside, throw your image in with all of its regular attributes, and then you can also add inside there what we call fig caption and then that would provide at the bottom of the picture a little text that describes it. Right. The beauty of putting it inside of a figure tag is the fact that it's all bundled together and then I can style it. So for example if like my background is like gray or something I could drop a picture into a figure tag and use a white background for it and all of a sudden it kind of looks like a photograph. So you can get kind of some, you know, simple little effects with it that are kind of cool. So try that one and see if it works for you. All right. Another interesting one is this one. This is called the, the meter tag. And this is kind of a weird thing. So notice, like, you might go to some websites and you see, like, they have these little bar charts and stuff. This is one that was added in HTML5. And you can actually go in here. You create the meter tag and you set up both a minimum and maximum. So like what numeric values might sit on this thing? So for example, you might go zero to 100. And then the value you want it to display, which is the first attribute, is, is the whole thing. So on this first one, where the max is 144.17, the value is 144.17, so it goes full tilt. On like these other ones, they do it a little lower, a little lower, a little lower, and by just changing that value, it moves it down farther on the chart. You might not have a reason for this, but you could maybe see like when, you know, when Jason was here earlier showing us his stuff, where he might have like a, a meter thing that reads data from an application and drops it in there dynamically with JavaScript and then puts it up on the screen so you can see your sales. That's the kind of thing you can do with this. So that's kind of a a cool new element. Very similarly, they have one called the progress thing. You see this pretty often too. Once again, uh, creates kind of like that bar chart kind of thing. And the fascinating thing about this one is you can control it with JavaScript again. So if you were like, let's say downloading a file, you could actually write JavaScript that like reads the download going and then feeds data back into this and dynamically shows it moving or just read some piece of information that you put in and displays it on the screen. That's a fun one. But here's one that I think that you might find a little bit more useful, frankly. And that's the CSS background uh, image property. So, so far we've been doing backgrounds and we've been doing backgrounds that um, are colors, right? Well, and that's fine. But sometimes you go to websites and you see they have like cool images in the background. You're like, hmm, all right, now I'm kind of starting to think a little bit, right? So I'm thinking that with my website that I'm building, yeah, it might be kind of nice if I had some like graphics in the background here. 
And what you can do uh, as a designer, folks, there are plenty of ways to get uh, images. I'm trying to, where's my search? Here it is. And I don't know if I want like anything like necessarily Mr. Robot, but you can actually come in here and you can go, you can search backgrounds, right? So I'm just going to type background down and let's see what we find. Maybe something here would be really kind of cool. Um, this one's kind of neat, right? I don't know, what would look really good for Mr. Robot? Well, it's technology. Let me know if you see one that strikes you somehow. I don't know, I, I guess I'm liking that first one. I, I'm going to just go with this one, you know, because we're kind of running out of time, too. Um, and let's go and uh, see that. And I'm looking, well, it's not really all that big, but could I still make it work? You know what, let's try it, you know? Worst case scenario is we try it and it, it looks horrible. So I'm going to save this image. It's going right to my Unit 4 Images folder. Oh my God, look at that long file name. What a nightmare. I'm noticing it's got the J -E -P JPEG file extension. And I'm just going to say, I'm just going to call it background. Uh, and I'm going to keep the file extension the same as it was originally and save it. Now I'm going to go in and I'm going to apply that background to the body section of my page. I want you to watch what this does. So I'm going to apply it to the body. So I'm going to come in here to the body. And notice I already have background color black indicated. And now I want to put an image in. So I could get rid of this, right? In fact, that's probably what you might choose to do. So I'm going to switch this to image. And obviously black isn't an image. But then I need to, to link it up. And if you look at the, the code here, notice you have to wrap it inside the URL. And if it's in a separate folder, you need to point it to the folder too, folks. So here we go. So what I'm going to type is URL. And then inside there, I'm going to go to images, slash, and notice how it finds background for me. And notice how this added double quotes around it. The book showed it without. Either way works, just so you know. One tip though, you don't necessarily have to use this background image thing here. You can actually just say background. And then there's a short code that goes with it. So what happens if your image doesn't load? You know what? If my image doesn't load, make it black. That's my fallback. All right. Or maybe gray would be better. I don't know, but we'll see. <laughs> um, did I save that? Yes, I did. Okay, let's let's check it in the browser and see what happened. Now this could this this is either going to be hideous or brilliant. It's going to be one or the other, and I already know which it's going to be, but you guys don't. So, I'll do a refresh. And that, and this is what you do. <gasps> Almost right. What happened? The image isn't big enough to fill the whole screen. Right? So what it's doing in the background is it's tiling it. It's repeating it across and it's repeating it down. Now potentially that's not really so bad, but I don't I don't like the lines in it, folks. I, I just don't like the look. So what I could do is I could go out and I could find a much bigger image. That's one thing I could do. The other thing I could do is I could apply some more CSS. And I'm going to show you guys kind of a more advanced trick here. I hope you don't mind. Um, but there's a trick that I often use on my websites. And I might actually have to go look it up. Background size. And then I usually choose what they call cover. That one, unfortunately, I think you have to declare separately. Now watch what this does to the image. It forces it to fill the screen. That's a million dollar tip right there, because usually you don't get this until like your second HTML class. But now that image is big. But here's a little bit of the problem. It, it does look a little grainy, so I, I probably would pick a different image. But you know what? It's not too bad. And now you guys are seeing like piece by piece, we're transforming this site from something that looks like 
hideous plain old HTML to something that's visually more appealing, hopefully. You know, there's opinions involved here too. You know, some people might like it and some people might hate it. But we're, we're, we're making those steps towards something that looks like a real website. They talk here about how the repeat actually works. So if you start looking at these, if you do want your image to repeat, so there are the, the situations where some people will create a little graphic that actually is repeatable, and then they tell it to repeat Y or repeat X. And here's how that works. The X dimension on a screen, we'll talk about this more next week, so don't like freak out that we don't get to it all, um, is the across. So when I take a little graphic, and notice what they did here, is they started with this little image, a little green, dark green, a little brighter green, and that's the size of the image, and then they tell it to repeat X, and then what happens is it stretches all the way across the screen in the X direction. Like a Cartesian coordinate system, X goes across. If you flip that image so the dark green's on the left and the bright green's on the right, and you tell it to repeat Y, it will repeat top to bottom, and that can be an effect that works too. That's the Y dimension, okay? If you tell it not to repeat, a little tiny image like that will just appear. The default though is for it to repeat X and repeat Y at the same time. So if it doesn't fill the background, it will repeat in both directions. And there are complete strategies to this. In the old days, before we had some of these more advanced CSS techniques, some of us designers would go into like Photoshop and I would make a gradient, you know, like a dark blue to light blue that was like 2,000 pixels tall and I would repeat X and I'd have this like beautiful looking background. People were like, how did you do that? Right? Um, and it really was just a little bit of, you know, Photoshop magic and a little bit of coding magic. But then with CSS3, they really added some really cool new things where I don't have to go to Photoshop to do that anymore. I can do it right inside of the code. And that's, I think, where they're, where they're going next. So they, they talk about the repeat. Uh, it is also possible to do multiple background images, and, and that's kind of fascinating. So you can overlay one image and then take another image and add it in and have it positioned in the bottom right. So I could put in an image with like this little flower here that doesn't repeat right? That's a trillion foot gif, no repeat. That's this. And at the bottom right, I can place a secondary image. That's kind of a weird technique, but I, I do see people doing it. So you can actually layer images within there. All right. Some other uh, topics to talk about here. I'm going to go through these pretty quick because I realize we're at the end of our time. And if uh, I will say that anybody that needs to leave because you have to be somewhere, please feel free to go but I kind of want to finish the chapter, so I'm going to kind of race through the last few slides here to at least get it recorded for you. Uh, but like I said, if you have to leave, feel free to go. <clears throat> In the old days, when uh, we would do some weird things, um, we didn't have a lot of the same tools we had available, and we used this tool quite a bit. And I do find some people still use it. One really great example of this thing called an image map is we can take an image or a photograph that we've created, put it up on the screen, and then select regions of that photograph or image to be clickable to do various things. A really good example of that is I do still see websites that'll say like, what state do you live in? And they put up a map of the US and you can click on your state and it selects Wisconsin or whatever. So that's one practical usage for it. That technique, though, does require that you actually create the link and then describe the coordinates of X and Y of the outline of that image. It can be a square shape. It can be a polygon. It's a very time-consuming process. And I typically recommend that you don't do this at all. You know? However, it still works in HTML5. And probably the best application I've seen for it is like one of those maps, frankly. Okay? <coughs> you notice how the lady here, Door County Fishing, you think she might be from Wisconsin? She is. She lives up in Door County, the lady that writes this book. I think that's kind of cool. All right. 
Another thing that's kind of fun, and we're going to come back to this next week, so I promise we'll revisit this. But you ever go to a website, you notice that they have a little icon up in the toolbar that's got its own custom little graphic? You can do that too, folks. You can make your own, and I'll show you some tools for doing it. Uh, but you just add this line of code to the head section of your document and provide the icon file in your images directory or in the root of your project, and you can create that icon. So we will come back to this and do this one next week. It's not hard to do, uh, and there are some really cool tools out there that allow you to like go online, upload an image, convert it to an icon, or create the icon right there. And I think actually having a, what they call a favorites icon, I think is a really good idea for a site, because then when people go to your browser, you know, and they look, you know, notice all the companies have their own little logos that show you like what you're looking at. So you can control that as a designer. If you don't, then you get this generic whatever the browser puts in, like what we have now. But I'm, maybe for next week, I'll, I'll do like, I'll figure something out that'll look cool for Mr. Robot, and we'll throw that in there. We'll probably maybe use like the anonymous face or something like that. I think, uh, you, know, I, I th you know, that might look kind of cool. And if you guys don't know what that is, well, you'll find out next week. All right. There's also this thing called CSS sprites. And this is not a technique I see used as much anymore. But sometimes when people put lots of little images on websites, sometimes what they do is they just have this one giant image that has like a thousand icons in it. And then they use CSS sprites to basically focus in on the image they want. So the image gets loaded once and they pull one tiny image from it. I was never a huge fan of that approach. But I have seen people use it effectively. Who, who does, who still does? Yeah, they still do that, yeah. You know, and that, you know, it's not a, I'm not gonna say it's a bad technique, but it's not one that I ever preferred to use. I thought it was always pretty file inefficient because you're always loading a huge file to get a tiny icon. So I didn't see much of the point for it. All right, where do you get graphics? Well, Fireworks is no longer a product. I don't know why it's still in here. Uh, but you can actually go out to the internet like I just did and find lots of images. The only thing I caution you on is if you really want to be kind of on the up and up with your work, when you, whenever you do these like searches, one thing that's kind of neat about the Google search tools is they have this little category here for usage rights. And you notice by default it's not filtered by license, but you can switch to labeled for reuse or labeled for reuse with modification. That means you have to change at least 20% of the image. Or labeled for reuse is really um, what you want to pick to be safe in a commercial basis. But notice they have labeled for non-commercial reuse, right? So that would kind of be the education class. So if I like clicked on this one, um, then all these backgrounds are up for grabs for us. And you don't have to worry about copywriting it or any of that stuff. Whoever put it out there said, fine, go ahead, use it, I don't care. It is considered very uncool, though, to steal other people's stuff. It really is. And if it ever happens to you, you'll know the feeling. It's a horrible feeling because it's happened to me. And then to try to stop them, you know, you really kind of need lawyers involved to make people stop uh, doing it. Right? How do you get pictures? Well, you can actually pay for stock photographs. Some people do that. Or they hire photographers. Um, I don't know. I think the best thing to do is to take your own pictures and create your own graphics if you're so minded. If you're not, you're not an artist then you hire somebody. I, I used to do a lot of projects. I, I had a, a designer guy that I worked with. Uh, we both were teachers at the Art Institute. He would do all the graphics and the layouts, and I would do all the code. We had kind of a good thing going for a while. We did a lot of projects, made a whole lot of money. Um, right, some more tips. Yeah, I, you know, I'll give you some more tips about this. Generally speaking, when you take a photograph off of a camera load and try to put it on a website, you're going to find that you usually have to increase the brightness for a screen to make it look as good as it does on your other media. For whatever reason, the web kind of uh, requires that. All right, so these are just tips, frankly. So, um, all right, I'll let you read the tips on your own. All right, you know what? We're going to have to come back next week to pick up here. 
but we're going to talk about how to do border radii. So if you guys can, somebody can make a mental note, this is where we left off. And we'll, we'll finish this up next week. Uh, but you feel free to play with it. It's not hard to do. But basically, from here on through, they, they show some techniques for rounding corners. And I think that's kind of a nice look, too. All right, folks. We're all done. Thank you. We'll see you all next week. Video ends here.